Hey guys, um, I just wanted to upload a quick video. I'm going to be talking about how to begin your walk with Christ. Now I talked to Eric Gavu about making a video. If that's how, if that's how you pronounce your name, I, I'm so sorry, man. Um, I love y'all so much. I wanted to, I'm not able to pour in financially right now, but I wanted to be able to pour in spiritually. Um, and that's much, it says in Proverbs that that is much more to be desired than gold and silver. If you remember when Peter healed the, the lame man, he said, gold and silver I don't have, but what I do have, I give to you. Um, and I'm kind of in the same situation. Um, and I love preaching. And I love pouring into what God is doing. And I see that God is moving. I see the spirit moving. Um, so I want to teach y'all. I know that you are very limited on what um, you have, what resources you have in terms of Bible. So I'm going to be teaching y'all today. I'm going to be reading the scripture very slow. Um, I'm not sure how well your English is, but I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Translation or version um, so that you all can understand some of the words that are used in the Bible a little bit better. I'm going to be explaining everything that I'm saying, so don't worry. Um, and I'm preaching to not only the kids, but I'm preaching to everybody um, because the leadership there is also accountable for what's going on with the kids. Um, so I'm going to be preaching to everybody. I, I'm, I don't really know much about the Bible, but what I do know, I will tell you. Um, so we're going to get started. So we're going to be talking about how you get saved and how you continue to be saved and how you, and I'm going to start an introduction to how you get led into the spirit. Um, so what is so important right now is that I'm pouring into you. I'm pouring into you knowledge. I'm pouring into you the spirit of God. And so I knew that the Holy Spirit was telling me to do this today. So um, I'm, I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to um, glorify himself in this, this message and um, I know that y'all are very young. I don't know how old some of y'all are. Um, I'm personally 19 years old. And I want you to know that the Holy Spirit does not have an, he does not have an age. He doesn't have an age. I want you to know that in Ezekiel 1, it says that Ezekiel was 13 years old. Jeremiah was very young as well. David was very young as well. So there is no age when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to be preaching to you um, like you're being sent out to do God's work today. Um, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to tell you exactly what the word of God says. Um, so yeah, with that, we're going to be turning to Romans 10. So if you want to, someone wants to turn into the Bible, we're going to be turning to Romans 10. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to even teach y'all. Um, this is a great honor and something that I'm actually going to be taking on to myself. Um, I'm not sure how often I'm going to be doing this, but I'm thinking about every Wednesday. I want to pour into f you guys. I want to make disciples. I want to make sure that whatever is going on there um, is being monitored. Not, not that I have to monitor you, but I want you guys to be learning what the Word of God says and not just what um, some... <laughs> And I don't want it to sound like this, but what some white guy is saying. Um, so, yeah. So turning to Romans 10, 8 through 17, it says, but what does it say? It says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and end in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So what verse 8 is saying is that the kingdom of God is very reachable. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. The gospel is in your mouth and in your heart. It's easy. The explanation, the, the, com the, the complexity of the gospel is easy to understand. It says that, I'm just going to keep reading and then I'm going to explain it. It says in verse 9, But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is that simple. It says, if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. It says, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. So it says, with your heart. Now I want you to remember, it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, when Jeremiah, or not Jeremiah, but when Samuel was looking for a new king to replace Saul, God said, I don't look at the outward appearance. So some of you, if you're insecure, if you're worried about your outward appearance, God does not look at the outward appearance. He looks directly at your heart. He looks directly at your heart. It says in Revelation 2.23 as well, it says that I am the seeker of hearts. 
God does not care about his outward appearance. He cares about your inward appearance. And that was his problem with the Pharisees. Their out outward appearance was really religious. It's almost like other people held them as holy men, but their inward appearance, Jesus says, it was dirty and it was filthy and it was unclean. He called them hypocrites. And he says they were whitewashed tombs. So God is looking at your heart. For what the heart one believes in is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So what does that word justify mean? It says one is justified. Now that word justified, I want you to think about it in this way. It means just as if you had never sinned. So when you confess and you repent, it is just as if you had never sinned. <laughs> How many of you, and if you're watching this video, I want you to raise your hand. How many of you have lied? Raise your hand. I know I can't see you, but I know there are a few raising your hand. How many have stolen something? How many of you have been mean to somebody else? How many of you have actually done something evil? Spoken something, something said something dirty to somebody else, hit someone, was violent to somebody. Now, everything that I just listed are sins. But Jesus says that even though you've done those things, you're justified by the blood of Jesus. It says that the, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. It says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So in Romans 1, 16, Paul says is that I'm not ashamed for the gospel that I preach. Because for me, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the power of God. Now, sometimes it, for me, it's hard to proclaim the power of God. Not because I'm ashamed, but I'm afraid. And maybe I'm just trying to justify myself. I'm not sure. God, Only God knows. But don't be, don't be ashamed of the gospel. You won't be put to shame. Who cares if somebody puts you to shame? Who, tells, who cares if someone tells you that God isn't real if you know that God is real for yourself? God will not allow you to be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. It says, that for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. And so Jews and Greeks didn't get along. They didn't get along. But God's saying, there is no distinction. It says in Romans 2.11, it says that God shows no partiality. So I want, you to, I want you to realize this about God. Even though God necessarily doesn't like sin, he still allows the sun to come up on the sinner's. And on the righteous. He allows the, com he allows the sun to come up on both sides, on everybody. God doesn't show partiality. It says in John 3.34, it says, God does not give the spirit by measure. He doesn't, have a, he doesn't have a cup. I'm not special. I'm not special in any kind of way. God didn't have a cup for me. And he, didn't, he didn't pour in a ton of Holy Spirit or liquid or, or whatever you want to call it. And he didn't give me more than anybody else. It says God does not give the spirit by measure. So it says in Romans 5, 6, it says, or Romans 5, 5, it says that God has poured out his spirit on us, the love of God. It says he poured out his spirit abundantly. You have the same spirit who raised Christ. You have the same spirit of Paul. You have the same spirit of Jesus. All the miracles that Jesus did, he did by the Holy Spirit. And you have that same spirit. So God doesn't show partiality. There's no distinction between you and me and God's kingdom. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you've been through. And I know some of you have been through a lot. And I know that God sees you and he loves you. God doesn't show partiality. And so we see in verse 13, thank you, Lord, for everyone who calls on his name, calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so there's, there's a small distinction between calling on the Lord and confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so how I see it, and this is kind of my interpretation of the text, so I could be wrong, but in verse 
um, 10 and 11, we see that it says, anyone who confesses the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is Lord, will be saved. And so when you call upon the Lord repeatedly, you're showing that you have faith in God. And it says in Joel, uh, Joel 2.32, which this passage is actually derived from, says that there will be deliverance. So when you call upon the Lord, He will deliver you. He will deliver you. And so this is something you call upon the Lord once you have faith. Now it's different. It's, it's a tiny bit different, but calling upon the Lord or calling upon God shows that you have faith and anyone who consistently calls upon God in their time of need shall be saved. They shall be saved. Maybe not immediately. Maybe you won't see the results that you want immediately, but God, God, this is a promise from Jesus. This is a promise from God, the word of God. Jesus says in John 17, 17, it says, your word is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So when God says something, it says in Numbers 23, it says, has God said he will not do? So if you call upon the Lord, he will save you. Maybe not immediately. Maybe not the way that you see it, but he will save you. We all need saving, trust me. I need saving. I need God, deliver me. Lord, deliver me on this video. Deliver me from the grips of Satan. It says in Second uh, Timothy, I believe, 3.13, it says that God is faithful and he will deliver you from the evil one. Maybe not how you think it's going to happen, but God will deliver you. It's a promise. And so we're going to keep reading. It says, but how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? So how can you call on someone that you haven't believed or you haven't confessed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? So... It, how can you believe in somebody that you've never heard before? So we see in Acts 8, around, I think it's 40 through 46, that Philip, the evangelist, preached to a man, and he got in his chariot, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he was reading Isaiah 53. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I understand without a, without a teacher? And so what is so important about me teaching you is that you have to be, you have to be taught. Now, I'm being taught as well. And so the goal of the church is not to just sit around and have donuts. <laughs> Although donuts are great, but the goal of the church is to make Christians. We're supposed to be a Christian making machine. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make people, make disciples in other countries. And we can shed light on the gospel. But the only way that that can happen is that if you actually take what I'm telling you and apply it to your life. Or what the word of God is telling you. And how do they hear without someone preaching? So there has to be preaching. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So how can I preach to you? How can I preach to you if I'm not sent? See, I feel like God was putting this in my heart and I feel like I am sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. <laughs> I don't have beautiful feet. <laughs> but they have not obeyed the gospel. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was weird. <laughs> Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed, he who has heard from us. So faith. And so I want you to know, this is the key to faith in your life. Everybody, everybody needs to listen right now. It says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing comes by what? The word of God. So the way that you actually grow in faith is that you hear the word of God. It says in 1 Peter 1.23, it says the seed that has been sown in us is the word of God. It is not a perishing seed, but eternal. So it says, and um, Paul says, I, I planted Apollos watered, but God gives her increase. So you have, to, you have to hear this. That's what Jesus says many times in his sermons. He says, everybody listen, pay attention. Not just Hear with your ear, but understand. Have an understanding of what is going on. So when you hear and you understand, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is actually maybe the one, one of the most important principles in the entire Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so there are seven things that have to happen. The gospel must be given by Christ. 
Nobody else. Gospel means good news. And the fact that you can be saved by Jesus Christ is good news. It is good news. So it has to come through Jesus Christ, not through witchcraft. <laughs> well, that's a whole different topic. Not by witchcraft, not by the Book of Mormonism, not by Buddhism, not by Hinduism, not any other religion, but by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The gospel must be preached, not just by myself, not just by myself, everybody. Paul says, do the work of evangelists. Everybody is called to preach the gospel. Everybody is called to do. Everybody is called to preach the gospel in some shape or way or form. It may, be, it may look differently of how I'm doing it, but everybody is called to preach the gospel. Number three, a preacher is necessary. We can see that in verse 14 and 15. A preacher is always necessary. Always necessary. How can you, how can you learn something about school or in school if you don't have a teacher? So you, you can read the word of God, but if you don't tell, if you don't have somebody to tell you what it means, then it's, it's, it's going to be a lot more difficult. But it says in John 6, 45, it says, all the, all, I'm just going to read it. It says, John 6, 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. And everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So we're all going to be taught by God. We're all going to be taught by the Holy Spirit. But we also need someone like Jesus who is the image of God to come and teach us. That's why Jesus did the things that he did. Do you think Jesus needed to be baptized? The ba baptism was for the remission of sins. John's baptism was. Do you think Jesus really needed to be baptized? <laughs> Jesus was a sinless man, but he did it because we were also supposed to be baptized. Jesus did a lot of things so that we could just learn from him, not because he needed to learn how to do them, but because we needed to. So, number four, a preacher must be sent. And that could be me. That could be somebody else. But there must be a preacher sent. There must be preaching. There must be some kind of pre preacher that is mature in the word. Number four, uh, number five, the gospel must be heard. And not just heard. Not just heard with your ears. I mean, understand. Have an understanding of what's going on. Number six. The gospel must be believed. The gospel must be believed with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. It must be believed. It says that in verse 16. The gospel must be believed. But you, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, The Lord who has believed, what has he heard from us? And so when you believe, you also have faith. So I want you to know that that word faith, it isn't it. So there are two meanings, two main meanings. The first one means faithful. Faith means commitment. First, you are actively committed to God every single day. You have a committed relationship with God. You constantly get into prayer. You constantly fast. You constantly read your Bible. You are constantly committed to God. And then second is what we think up here. It is, it is up here, what we believe. Now, obviously, it all comes through belief. It all comes through faith. But faithful is the first word. You must remain faithful to God. Must, so number six, again, must be believed. Number seven, the gospel must be obeyed. And so if you remember what James 1, 21 and 20, or 20 uh, verses 21 says, it says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow with, of wickedness. Hold on, I'm just going to read it from this version because I, I think this might be a little more easy to understand for you guys. And I'm going to try to improve on how I'm teaching y'all. So <laughs> I love y'all so much. For the, hold on. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So, I, I can hear the word, right? I can have knowledge. But it says, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. It says, a wise person uses knowledge rightly. 
So if you don't have wisdom, if you're not a doer, then you just have a bunch of knowledge that is just sitting in your head that you're actually not using. There's no purpose in having it. It's like having a computer but not actually using it or not being able to use it. So you have to be a doer, not a hearer only deceiving yourselves. And so this is kind of what the Pharisees were like. They had a lot of head knowledge. Knowledge is great. But if we need more Bible obedience and not Bible knowledge. And I'm speak I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to all, but I'm challenging myself as well with this. So we need more Bible obedience and not Bible knowledge. And I want you to tell you, I want to tell you. If if you're asking this question, what is the most important thing about my Christian life? How do I get closer to God? And I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. It's your prayer life. Your prayer life is the most important thing about your walk. What does your prayer life look like? Do you How much do you pray? 10, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? What does your prayer life look like? I want to challenge you with that. Whoever's listening, I want to I want to challenge you. So it says the next principle we're going to go be over, going over is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So what is what is grace? What is grace? Grace is, un, you can, I want you to understand, this is favor from God. This is the, that Greek word means charis. It's undeserved. You cannot earn grace. It is a free gift from God. Free gift from God. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't work for it. It is freely given. It says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. It says in John 1, 17, it says, we got the law from Moses, but through Jesus, we got grace. We got grace. Not that there wasn't already grace, but Jesus is the source of this grace. It's favor from God that is undeserved. So it says, for by grace, this undeserving love, by faith. So you have to have faith in order to have grace. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it's not of our works, lest anyone should boast. So I want you to notice something. If you have something to boast, as Paul says, what do you have that you did not receive? I think it was James or Paul that said that. I apologize. <laughs> so what do you have that you did not receive? So in Christianity, we're not supposed to have anything to brag about. That's why Paul says, I boast in my weaknesses. Because that's the only thing that he had left. So grace and faith are both given by God. So you can't say, oh, I have this much faith. Because you didn't actually. God gave that to you. So... So it says, for by grace you have been saved. So this is a completed action. You have been saved. But it's presently being affected, if that makes sense. So you are saved. But it says, and I'm just going to read this to you. So you are saved. It's completed already, but you are also being saved. I'm going to read this to you. It says this in Hebrews 10:14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So, sanctified means made, it almost means, um, it almost means like you're being trans, like almost holiness. Like you're being sanctified into Jesus. It says we, we come closer to God. We look in the same image, the same glory of God, and we transform it into Jesus. It says this in 2 Corinthians 318 it says we are turning into Jesus from glory to glory basically you are being sanctified but you are already saved now I can go into that a further a further time but we have to keep going 
So even grace and faith are given by God. And so it, it is freely given. So in Acts 28, 16, it says that we were taken from the power of Satan to God when we entered from darkness to light. And so I want you to notice, if you're sitting in a dark room, if you open the window, the darkness is not going to go out. You open the door, the darkness is not going to go out. So how is nighttime, how do, how do we get daytime? How does light come in? How does the darkness flee? Well, darkness only flees when you bring in light. You can't let it out a window. You can't let it out. You, can, you, you can't overcome darkness without light. And so when we, Jesus, who was the light of the world, came into our life, we went from the power of God, or power of Satan to God. And so I want to I want to touch on this verse, verse ten. So it says, "For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves; it is a gift of God, not a works lest anyone should boast." And so it says that we are called to do these things. So it doesn't just stop at grace and faith, and that's where a lot of preachers and a lot of people stop. But it says that we were called to do these things for works. And so I want to I want to go into something. So if we turn to Deuteronomy eleven thirteen, there was a principle in the Old Testament. And so, y'all know, because y'all, sorry, this beanie's kind of scratchy. <laughs> y'all know, because y'all plant food. And so there was this biblical principle in the Deuteronomy 11, 13, and I'm going to explain this after. It says, And the land the Lord your God cares for, the eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. He will give the rain for you. So it says, he will give you the rain. He will give you the rain. If you love him with all your heart and all your soul. And you serve him. He will give the rain for you in its season. The early rain and the latter rain. You will you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And so the early rain was came in October to soften up the soil for the latter rain. And so I'm assuming that in the early you would plant seeds, and by March came around, all of it, all the plants would be mature. And so this is how we see the Holy Spirit as well. This is how we see the Holy Spirit as well. So the rain, the rain was for the harvest. And so we see in, um, when Jesus, when he talks about the harvest, in Matthew nine thirty eight, he's talking about people. So the rain, the latter rain represent, represents the Holy Spirit and the harvest represents the people. And so the reason that you're actually given the Holy Spirit is for works, is for the harvest. So if you just say, I have the Holy Spirit, but you sit around, then you're not fulfilling what God wants you to be doing. So turning to Jeremiah 5.23, and we got to get going. I'm a little long. I hope you all enjoyed this. I love preaching so much. Thank you, Lord. I'm turning to Jeremiah 5.23. It says, But this, this people has a stubborn and a rebellious heart, and they have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the, week, the weeks appointed for the harvest. So it says there were certain weeks appointed for the harvest. And so... I want you to imagine that you go sit down somewhere. And I don't know if y'all have experienced this before, but you go sit down somewhere and there's a there's a sign that says reserved. And so there was a sign in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit fell, there was a sign that said reserved on it. And so this is a week that Satan cannot mess with. And so what happened was, is that Jesus had already come in and he established the early rain when he blew the Holy Spirit on them. But in Acts 2, we see that the latter rain came in when they were mature and 3,000 souls got saved. So this Holy Spirit came for the purpose of reaping the harvest. It was for the harvest. Over and over again, we see that pattern. So turning to Joel 2.23. So we are called to do works. That's why Jesus says, "Don't hide your light under a lamp, or don't hide your, don't hide your light under a basket. Let everyone see your good works. Not that you should seek 
You want to seek God first. Don't seek the pleasure of man. That's why Paul says in Galatians 1.10, he says, For do I now persuade God or man? Do I, do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, then I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. He has poured out down for you the abundant rain and early and latter rain as before. It says that the threshing floors shall be full of grain and your vats will overflow with new wine and oil. So again, this rain was for the harvest. And so, and, and literally right after this, it says in verse 28, it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. It says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, not just the white man, not just the black man, just on all flesh, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, on all flesh, the Germans, who, whoever. It says on all flesh, not some of it, not 10% of it, not 50, all flesh. So this Holy Spirit is the latter and the early rain. And it's intended for the harvest. So when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it is intended for the harvest. And it says there's no age restriction for the Holy Spirit. There's no restriction for casting out demons. There's no age restriction for healing the sick. There's no age restriction for prophesying. There's no age restriction for baptizing. There's no age restriction for any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Or the ministry gifts or the fruits of the... There's no age restriction. There is not a single verse in the Bible that says that there's an age restriction. And so when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the power to do things that you were not previously able to do. It says in Matthew 16. And so I'm letting you know what you were able to do in Christ. Because we only have one chance to do these things. You only have one chance to do these things and you go to heaven. And you're going to be judged by your works because faith without works is dead, according to James. And I'm not trying to push you. I'm not, I mean, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. We are called to do works. We are called to lay our hands on the sick and heal them. I know, I know it's what the Bible says. So in Mark 16, it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to this the create whole creation whoever believes and is baptized will be saved and whoever does not believe will be condemned and so you don't have to ha be baptized in some kind of big church if you have not been baptized and you're watching this get baptized today today is the day of salvation today is the day that you will be saved today is the day that you will be filled with the holy spirit and speak in tongues today is the day i'm putting faith into somebody today is the day and these signs will accompany those who believe. And in my name, they will cast out demons. So it says these signs will follow those who believe. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. These signs will follow those who believe. Just like if I dropped Cheerios or if I was dropping food while I walked and it was behind me, just like miracles should follow you. And I'll pick up new servants with their hands. And they will pick up new servants with their hands. And if they drink anything deadly, anything... Uh, I want to share this with you because I think this is hilarious. I, I recently found out that this church actually does serpent, like they actually pick up serpents, like actual serpents with their hands. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Not they might recover, not they might like maybe recover, but it says they will recover if you believe. So then the Lord Jesus, after he spoke to them, was taken up to heaven. He sat down at the right hand of God. So it says these signs will follow those who believe. So what is the next step? How do, how do I, if you're, if you're listening, how do I keep moving forward? How do I, how do I give my life to Christ? And we're, we're coming up to a wrap. And, and I'm going to do, I'm going to do something at the very end. And I'm going to have to rely fully on the Holy Spirit. Because if he doesn't show up, this is not going to work. And if he said, and he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, so he's saying, if anyone wants to come after me, if anyone wants to love me, if anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to do anything related to me, if you want to preach the gospel, this is what you have to do. He says this in all, I think he says this in Mark, Matthew, and, um, and, and Luke. I don't know if he says this in John. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. 
Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Follow me. So what does this mean? So number one, you have to be willing to follow Christ. You have to be willing to give up all. Everything that you hold so dearly. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not throwing out certain examples. I'm not saying, because I know that some of you don't have much. But it says that God, it says that those who Jesus gives much, much will be required of them. Jesus, he knows your circumstance. And I, I want to read you a verse because I want you to understand that Jesus was a human. Jesus was a man. It says, for because he himself suffered when tempted. It says that Jesus suffered. He's able to help those who are being tempted or those who are suffering as well. Jesus sees your suffering. Jesus sees your suffering. I feel like there's a little boy listening. I might get, I might be getting a word of knowledge, but I think there's a little boy listening and you, 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 there's something wrong with your knee. You've been feeling really discouraged. You've been feeling really discouraged, dude. You hit your knee on something, something like that. I want you to know that Jesus, he sees you. You've been hurting for a long time, dude. You've been hurting for a long time. I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ loves you. Lord, I pray that he would be healed right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So seven things you have to be willing to do in order to follow Christ. Number one, be willing to follow Christ. So it says in Luke 5.11, when Jesus, I'm just going to read this to you. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. So when Jesus called Simon, when when Jesus called Peter, when he called John, when he called James, it says they left all, they forsook all and followed him. And this is the same kind of mentality, the same kind of pursuit that we have to have of Jesus when we follow him. So number two, deny yourself. It says those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It says in Galatians 6.6 6, that our old man has to pass away. And that old man being that old carnal nature of Adam. That sin. Everything has to become new. It says, and therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, but old things become new. You have to become a new creature in Christ. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Paul says, I die daily. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Take up your cross daily. Not periodically, not sometimes, or when you feel comfortable, but every single day. Every single day. Number four, follow to the end, not just for a week. It says in Mark 13, 13, it says, those who endure to the end shall be saved. You have to endure to the end. You have to finish your race with joy. Paul was eager to finish his race. He says, my, my life is not dear to me. Revelation 12, 11, it says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of the testimony. They did not love their lives unto the death. So these people that died for the gospel, they didn't love their life. They loved the Lord more than they loved their life. That's why they gave it up for him. Follow to the end, not just for a week. Follow to the very end. And you will be a conqueror. It says, if we die with Christ, we will reign with him. If we live, we will reign with him. Lose life, not gain it. I want you to remember that John the Baptist says, I must decrease, he must increase. And that's, and that's sometimes my prayer. I must decrease, he must increase in my life.
whatever you want to in here. It says, for what does a... It says, whoever who saves his life, save his life, would save his life, will lose it. Whoever who loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. So you must lose your life, not gain it. And so when you lose your life, you actually find it. Number six, you have to live free from the world. It says in 1 Peter 1, 6, God says, you are, I am holy, so you must also be holy. I want you to know it says in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 16, it says, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. It says, if you defile your temple, it says this in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 or 2 Corinthians 3. It says, if anyone defiles the temple, God will destroy it. You have to make sure that you are taking care of your temple. That Hebrew word for holy just means set apart. Set apart for the world. So if I have a bunch of Skittles and I have an M&M, and I take it out of that pile and put it in the pile of M&Ms, that's what we are supposed to be to the world. The world is the, the Skittles, and we are the M&Ms. Don't be like the Skittles. Just remain an M&M. And so the reason that we, set up, we are set apart from the world is that we don't so we don't become like them. I want to read you some characteristics in 2 Timothy 3. It says, but, and we are in the last days. Jesus Christ is returning soon. But understand this, that in the last days there will be come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self. And that is the root for all of these things. Lover of yourself. Do you love yourself? It is not wrong to love yourselves, but it says lovers of yourself. You, do, you love yourself more than anybody else. Do you love yourself more than you love Jesus? Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpeaceable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers, lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having this appearance of godliness but denying its power. So people will have this appearance of godliness, but they will deny the power that can make them like God, make them like Jesus. And we are, this, I mean, if you're listening to this, you're like, oh my goodness, dude, this is exactly what's going on right now. And that's right. For among them are those who creep in the house into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. So this is the type of stuff that goes on in the world. Number seven. We live ashamed of the gospel. Again, Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Go. It says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Is your faith bold? I'm going to challenge some of you. I know you're all young. I'm young too. <laughs> is your faith bold as a lion? So next, next and last thing, once, once you do all these things, I'm going to lead you into a prayer today if you want to get saved. I know that y'all are all in a Jesus organization, but just because you go to church doesn't mean you're necessarily saved. And I learned that the hard way. I learned that the hard way, man. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And that, that, that connotation, that verbiage means continually led by the Spirit of God. I don't know that's how you necessarily say it, but it says continually led by the Spirit of God. It says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Are you hearing God's voice? Are you being led by the Spirit of God? It says in Acts 8 that Philip heard the voice of the Holy Spirit to go tell him to go somewhere. Make sure you're listening to his voice. It says in 1 Kings 19, 12 that his voice sounds like a still small voice. It's not this loud, powerful voice like you would expect God to sound like. But he's calm. He doesn't push you. He's calm. Still, small voice. Almost like a whisper. Led by the Spirit of God. For you did not come 
You, for you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cried, Abba, Father, Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Be completely led by the Spirit of God. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and his nudges and what he wants you to do. It says in John 16, 13, it says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you to all truth. It says, for when he, the Spirit of truth, has come. So I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is a person living on the inside of you. Jesus says, I will send another. Just like if I ordered food, if I ordered a bag of rice and I said I want another, I would get the exact same bag of rice. Just another one. So Jesus, it says the Lord is the Spirit. It says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You have the same Spirit who raised Christ. So I want to I lead you through a prayer. If you're struggling, I, I, want you to, I want you to say this. I'm going to say this very quick. It says, I want you to say this, okay? Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God and the only way to God. I believe that you died for me and you rose again. And you conquered sin and you defeated death and the grave. Lord Jesus Christ, I want to serve you. I confess that you are Lord with all my heart and with all my soul. Come into my life, Lord. Fill my heart. I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit, not just a little bit, but an overflow of the Holy Spirit. Lord, my heart burns for you. I love you and I need you. Lord, set me free. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm gonna do this. I want you to just listen, okay? Now if you feel like the Holy Spirit is entering into you, into your spirit, there is a sign in the Bible, and it says, and this sign is called speaking in tongues. Now, I want, you to, I want you to earnestly ask God for the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, I want the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to fill my cup in the name of Jesus. And I'll, there's going to be something that's going to start happening in your mouth. And Holy Spirit, I need you to show up. And there's going to start, your tongue is going to want to start saying stuff like, And these are called speaking in tongues. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes in your life. Let it start coming out. Start speaking in new tongues. This is the sign of the Holy Spirit. If you feel it, if you feel it, let it go. If you feel it, the Holy Spirit is, is filling you, let it go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, fill them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm relying on you. Lord, fill them. Lord, overtake them. Lord, consume them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm, Lord, I'm placing my hands on them. Lord, I'm placing my hands on them. Lord, fill them. Lord, fill them through my hands. Lord, in Jesus' name. It is finished, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I hope you all enjoyed this lesson. I love you all so much. I'm going to continue to send you all lessons. I hope this benefited you. Um, I'm going to actually... I'll figure that out later. I love y'all so much. I hope some of y'all got reborn today. I love y'all so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. <laughs>